Hello. I think you're there, yeah. Well, hopefully you've had uh, a good afternoon of knowledge sharing and prototyping and uh, throwing our jargon around that hopefully has now made some kind of sense to you. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to flip through the workbook a bit and on page 32 of your workbook, we've actually inserted a couple of pages for you to note down people that you've met with, that you wanted to remember for later, to contact and all of that. Uh, so do flip to that. Sometimes, uh, I know when I get home, I have a whole stack of business cards and don't always remember who these people were. Um, so um, <laughs> in a little bit of self-interest, it was for that that we put some things in the workbook for you. Uh, so, thank you for uh, all the energy that you um, put out today and for uh, being really great participants and listeners. Um, just wanted to chat for a, a really brief moment about um, the grant pro, uh, program component of Audience Revolution. Uh, as Kevin Moore mentioned in the session earlier today, um, we've, we, TCG, has had a very long-term history of commitment to audience engagement and community development. It goes decades and decades back. Uh, we develop our programs really based on listening to the field, listening to feedback from all of you. And our programs change and morph uh, as they go on because we want to make sure that, that they're as relevant as they possibly can be. Um, we listen to people at think tanks. We recently had a uh, joint think, think tank with our partners at the Arts Presenters and Dance USA. I know Scott Stoner is in the house somewhere. Scott right there. And Suzanne Callahan is also in the house, I hope, somewhere. Uh, but do ask them. And our uh, brilliant own Lisa Mount facilitated that meeting. We had uh, a small group of representatives from the theater, dance, and the presenting world uh, to really uh, explore the idea of does it make sense for our three disciplines to come together as a cohort in a convening to talk uh, in, in about these kinds of issues but in a larger way. Uh, so a lot of that uh, will unfold, uh, I think, as we're developing our grant program. Uh, Kevin Bitterman, sitting right up the front here, is my partner in crime on the grant programs, and we actually haven't written the guidelines for <laughs> the Audience Revolution grant program yet, particularly because we wanted to wait until this convening is o over so that then we could debrief what we've heard, what we've learned, and try to incorporate that into the program. Um, what we have learned so far from uh, the last round of the grant program, and those were uh, 10 grants of up to $65,000 each, uh, we uh, have learned from different convenings and recipients that there's an overwhelming desire for people to travel to see each other's work. Uh, we've also learned uh, that there is, as we've been talking about through this convening, uh, a great value in peer knowledge and learning together. So both of those uh, bits of learning that we've got are going to be incorporated into the grant program. Uh, there will be approximately 10 to 15 travel grants specifically, so you all, uh, if you get a grant, can travel to see the work of your peers. Um, what we also saw actually in the first round of the grant program that there were three of the recipients who were um, working together with uh, partners in the Latino community. And we looked at that and said, well, there seems to be obviously there a natural cohort, and what if we had a grant program that supported that? Uh, so we're trying things out for the first time. We're going to be learning from this program as much as you will uh, in many ways, but we're going to be uh, awarding uh, larger grants to a smaller cohort. Uh, so there will be uh, three grants 
increments of uh, 300,000 each. Um, and the big plus, I have to acknowledge, and I'll um, bring up Cheryl Akemia from uh, the Duke in a second, uh, is they uh, have been fabulous, fabulous partners and really recognize the value of unrestricted funds, funds that are specifically for general operating needs uh, that are not linked to a project that you have to deliver on. Um, <laughs> Um, and so that, again, will be a feature of this program. Uh, so we will be continuing to share the learning both on uh, TCG's um, circle. People, recipients will be blogging about their experiences because while these cohorts are going to be benefiting, frankly, uh, a relatively small group of people, hopefully their learnings will ripple out to the larger field. Um, and uh, there will also be other opportunities in the upcoming conference in Cleveland where we'll be able to report out on this convening here uh, and the other things that are happening. Uh, so I know a lot of you have come up to me and, and asked for a lot of specifics. When are those guidelines going to be done? When can we apply? Um, and, and so that's just a little general, but basically because we want to listen to you. Uh, so be patient with us, and we will send that out, and we're going to launch the program um, in June uh, in Cleveland at the National Conference. So hang tight on that. Um, so as I you know, alluded to or mentioned earlier, um, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation has been our long-term partner in this work that we've been doing. Uh, they've been constant and committed uh, friends of theater who really keep our feet to the fire at TCG and keep us honest, you know? Um, and really, uh, evidence of their commitment to the field is the general operating support that they really said should be a part of this program. Um, they've got their own programs, uh, which uh, I'm going to bring Cheryl up to talk a bit about building demand for the arts. So uh, please thank and welcome Cheryl Ikemia. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, it's very rare that the funder gets to talk to everyone like this. And uh, I, I really want, on behalf of our staff, uh, Ben Cameron, who is known to many of you, uh, having been here uh, at TCG for many years, and uh, Lillian Ose Boteng, who's here with me today, and Zeba Rahman, who's one of our new staff members. I'd like to thank everybody uh, on behalf of our crew, and uh, as, as Amelia said, um, their process of developing the programs and learning and um, learning from the community, uh, first going out into the community and finding out what is on their minds and what's important to them is also our process as well. And um, so, but we do have guidelines <laughs> this time, and uh, we're, we're ready to go with our program building um, demand for the arts. The, um, this, this program, I, I'd like to explain to you, is part of our $50 million initiative that our board uh, gave to us right after the crash, actually, um, 2008. Um, our, our president, Ed Henry, went to them and asked them, can we still, uh, there's still a huge need out in the field for artists, and we know that times are tough and our, our uh, endowment portfolio went down by a third, and but the board was willing to take this risk, and so it's a 10-year initiative. Building demand for the arts is the third element. Um, the first two elements of the, the program are the Doris Duke Artist Awards and the Doris Duke Impact Award, and um, Rachel Ford, who's running that program, is here also if you have any questions about that, but it's about giving virtually unrestricted funds to the artists who are um, chosen, and we'll have 200 by the time the program is over. Um, so this program, Building Demand for the Arts, was another way of thinking about how uh, we can help artists and um, build relationships with organizations. And so the program is open to the jazz, dance, and theater community. Um, what we wanted to do was to help strengthen the relationship between artists and organizations um, over a longer period of time. And it's more so about bringing the artists in to think about building demand, not about making a new work. It's about going into the, embedding uh, the artist in an organization 
and um, thinking, working with different departments. And I was just with the uh, the marketing and engagement, uh, listening to what they were talking about. And um, so it's 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 helping having the artist go into different departments and thinking about how to build demand. Um, we see artists as a, a, a great resource, probably um, an underutilized resource for organizations and um, who can bring in their creative thinking and experience. Um, their, you know this, this already. Um, th they would help to conceive, plan, and execute uh, a strategy for building demand. Um, and this is something that we feel um, will help to build longer term relationships between artists and organizations because of what we've heard in the past about artists dropping into an organization and then really not feeling a part of that organization. But what we wanted to do was to build a more sustained relationship so that together uh, the artists and organizations can reach out into the communities that they want to build relationships with. So basically this program is that. Um, our first, as it's a sort of a learning process for us too as well, um, building demand for the arts has had gone through two rounds. And in the first round, we felt like perhaps we were rushing the relationships um, before fruitful discussions could take place and testing of ideas, just piloting some ideas, um, and also reaching out to the targeted communities. So um, then we we bifurcated the program, so now it's exploration and implementation. And, and actually this year, uh, we will be doing both the exploration grants and the implementation grants. Um, and if I know it's, it's a lot of things to, um, for me to explain to you, but basically all this information, uh, the grant sizes for exploration are uh, 20 and $40,000, it depends upon the organizational size. Um, and uh, those have, are, uh, the artists have to be on site for 30 days uh, over a 15 month period. So it gives a lot of flexibility to the artists and the organization to plan. Um, implementation grants are, um, are larger, they're 55,000, $110,000, um, and they also depend upon the size of the organization. Um, we're hoping that there'll be more uh, opportunity to really delve deeply into an idea, to execute an, an implemented plan, um, and to evaluate the program. So like a fu a funders are always interested in evaluation, but um, we are going to offer a lot of help along that way too um, with the grantees. So um, important things, oh uh, also the, the best kind of artist for this program is not one who's within the ranks of the organization but close enough to have shared goals and values. Um, they must have some prior experience relationship with the organization and in addition the um, artists need not be from the same field. So. For example, a theater could bring in a media or a visual artist or a choreographer or whatever you define um, and uh, to help think about a different way of approaching certain ideas that you want to uh, or communities that you want to reach. Um, so uh, as I said, you know, we're going to, the, the implementation grants are going to have more of an evaluation component to, to them as well. Uh, and we will provide additional funds for that. Um, and all of this, I know it's a lot that I have to explain, but um, all of this is on our website. So our, our guidelines for both programs are on the website. There's a big overview paper that really um, explains the rationale behind our thinking. And um, Alan Brown, who been, we've been working with to eval help evaluate the first round of grantees, um, has has a working paper which is called Building Demand for the Performing Arts, and that's also on our website, which is um, ddcf.org. So um, look that up. The important thing is that we have a deadline coming up, and this is for the uh, intent to apply, which is going to be on April 24th. And it's really just to um, 
put your name in, uh, say this is the artist that we want to work with, and that's basically it, some basic information, but the, um, the full proposals for the exploration um, um, and the preliminary applications for the uh, implementation are due on May 29th. We're gonna have a, um, a webinar that uh, is discussing the first round of grantee organizations and um, they will present their progress, their challenges, and this is going to take place um, online, well, a, a webinar, um, on April 28th between 2 and 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and you can get all that information on um, our website. So just to get some feedback about what happened uh, with those organizations and what it meant to have the artists on site for that period of time. Uh, we also have two webinars on the application process on May 5th and 14th. Um, so that'll give you sufficient, I hope, some time to really um, grapple with the questions that you have. Uh, one thing that, that, as I said before, this is a 10-year journey for us. And so um, we will have one more round of implementation grants uh, in 2018 if if we feel like there's sufficient interest um, from this year. And um, so building demand then will conclude with that round. So it's a, it's a finite program with, and we feel like it's complementing so many of our other programs that we're doing, as Amelia said, um, with TCG, Dance USA, and arts presenters. We've, uh, we have multiple programs in um, working in this area of audience engagement. So um, just check out the details, the information um, that's on our website, uh, and tune into our webinars. And I must say that um, having been here for this day and, and a half, um, I'm so grateful for the opportunity for you to be open and to let the funders listen, because often I think the perception is that we don't listen, that we don't um, we don't really care, we just change our priorities overnight and turn everything upside down. But really, it's our, um, it's our opportunity to be here and to listen and to hear what your, your concerns are and your needs are that, um, and your generosity uh, in sharing with each other that is, is so rewarding for us. And I must say that I'm, I'm so grateful to be here and very humbled by all of the incredible work, the fantastic work that you're doing in your communities and, and with the artists, people that you're reaching out and, and to and making real change. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thanks a lot, Cheryl. Um, yesterday, uh, Hannah and I, uh, as part of our prep work, had uh, a lot of fun going to uh, all of the sites where you all are going to be doing field trips tomorrow. Uh, and we had the great opportunity to spend a little bit of time with Pat Jordan over at the 18th and Vine District. Um, so I want to bring Pat up. Um, Pat is the president of the GEM uh, Cultural and Educational um, program and Center. Center, thank you. Uh, and come on up. Thank oh, you. Thank you very much. A little technical magic happening here. Nothing to see, nothing to see. <laughs> Your clicker awaits. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Kansas City. You know, I, I uh, just wanted to have a conversation with you, Willie. I have five minutes to do so. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Jeff Church and uh, Joette Pelster for reaching out to me. Um, I started out my career in theater, as many of us in arts administration have, and that is uh, singing and dancing and acting in grade school, only to have uh, gone on to high school. And as I was preparing to become a professional, my parents, of course, saying, oh, no, you will need to do something. Uh, you will need to get uh, a paying job somewhere. 
And so after graduating from the University of Missouri School of Journalism, I came back to Kansas City. But you know, of course, once it's in your blood, it's in your blood. You can't get rid of it. And so I was uh, driving uh, down 18th and Vine a lot and um, would pass by this glorious uh, uh, Art Deco front of what is known as the Gym Theater. And I kept saying to myself, you know, somebody needs to do something with this. And so I started in my mind, I'd served on the boards of the Kansas Friends of Alvin Ailey, the Folly Theater, and, and others. Again, don't, you don't get it out of your blood. And I said, you know, uh, I started coming up with these ideas. And so the folks who owned the theater, the Black Economic Union, heard about that, came to me and said, why don't you do something? about this. Why don't you take this project on? And so I said, OK. Uh, and uh, so eight years later, uh, we went through this process of actually having to tear down all of the walls of the theater. Because the Jim Theater really was just a neighborhood movie house. It played second run uh, westerns, western movies. And there was no stage. So the challenge for us was, how do we turn what was once just a neighborhood movie house into something that could accommodate, not only accommodate live theater, but also something that would be 21st century ready? So I had these long discussions with the historic folk. And finally, I said, OK, if you just let us preserve this wonderful facade and you let us rebuild everything else, uh, life will be beautiful. And they bought that. And uh, so. <laughs> And so to eight years later, uh, 502 seat theater. Wow. Uh, yeah, I'm proud of it. I have no husband, no children, and no. But. <laughs> so, OK. So after that birth, I, um, it was OK, just so what do you do? What do you do after you, uh, after you do a theater? Um, I was invited by a developer to come to go two blocks south. And this is an old uh, fire station at 21st and Vine. And so um, I've now moved into that uh, edifice. And we are looking at, and, and I, I produce uh, art shows. and. We do multimedia stuff in there as well. Uh, but one of the things that I started thinking about, though, was how is it that we really go beyond our buildings and into the community? Um, and this is one of the artists that I, <clears throat> excuse me, I have ex exhibited. Um, we, uh, we have some fabulous visual artists here in Kansas City and fabulous art galleries and doing arts and education as well. <clears throat> excuse me. But one of the things that I started thinking about is, how is it that we impact our neighborhoods? So we are very close to what's known as the Key Coalition neighborhood in Kansas City. There are 60 acres of vacant land there. There are 200 empty structures. And so I really, and, and, and the other thing is, is that I found out during this period of time that we have in Kansas City some 7,000 vacant houses, 7,000 vacant houses. And that is really akin to uh, the Ninth Ward in New Orleans. And I, I learned this about four or five years ago. You know, there are stages of realization that you go through when you hear something like that. You know, and you start driving around in your own neighborhoods looking at things more closely. And you start thinking about the educational system. And you start thinking about the numbers of people who have moved to the suburbs and and, and, and why all this has happened, why there have been, in this particular neighborhood, a loss of over 500 housing units. Um, these are other indicators, you know, as the statisticians call them, uh, of what is happening in the neighborhood. So when you're talking about art, and when you're doing art, and you're talking to groups of folk who are faced with these kinds of challenges, you kind of want to change your tune. Um, so one of the things I started talking about when going into the neighborhoods was the definition of success and the fact that we needed to really take a different kind of look at that. 
So we talk about this a lot, that it's not necessarily the McMansion in the suburbs that makes life happy. What, what, really, is, what really is will make you happy. These are some of the things that we're beginning to tackle in, in that particular neighborhood. Um, one of the things that I have recently been hired to do is there, there's a church that is um, building a community center, and they've hired me, because of my experience with the gym theater, to assist them with that. It's being built, $6 million facility being built across the street from a $70 million East Patrol station. Um, the other thing that we're doing, we've bought a house, and we're going to, uh, uh, this is what we want it to look, at, to look like. <laughs> this is what it looks like now. <laughs> I bought another one as well. But we want to fix that up and put an artist in it. Get this particular artist um, credit ready so that he can buy the house. And, and that's, that's really what, what we're doing in terms of community development. We're taking the arts, using it as a catalyst for community development, going deeper into the community and formulating relationships. Um, we'd love for you to, 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 to help us. If you have some ideas, text me, give me a call. Again, welcome to Kansas City. Thank you for your time. Thank you, just inspiring. Um, I want to introduce, actually, Shade Litka, uh, got another inspiring woman. Actually, Shade is the CEO of the National Black Theater uh, in Harlem in New York and is keeping her mother's legacy alive, Dr. Barbara Antier, uh, in a phenomenal space. Uh, go visit their space uh, or talk to Sade and Jonathan McCrory is right there. Ask them about the incredible sculptures in their building, actually. Um, she and Jonathan brought uh, Pastor Mike to our attention and I wanted to bring Sade up to just talk a bit, right? Hey, y'all. Um, so this is that time of the day where like the sugar is starting to like, you know, diminish a little bit, a great art break, but we have something for you that will be that inspiring and that invigorating, which is why I'm up here. Um, I get the profound honor to introduce our last speaker of the evening, who will make you drink the Kool-Aid. Um, <laughs> which is kind of what happened with the TCG staffers that were in the audience uh, when MBT um, put on a state of emergency town hall in response to Ferguson called a state of emergency race resistance and police violence from Ferguson to Flatbush. Michael Walren was one of our panelists at the time. Pastor Michael Warren is the senior pastor of First Corinthian Baptist Church in Harlem. We call him Pastor Mike. Um, and once you hear him speak, you will want to hear him speak over and over again. And it really is a testament to all the folks at TCG putting together Audience Revolution because what they're bringing us is they're encouraging us to think outside the box. So having a pastor be one of our speakers is absolutely thinking outside the box. But why? Um, well, here's why. When Pastor Mike uh, started out at Zion Temple, Zion Temple United Church um, of Christ in North Carolina, he grew his congregation from 25 members to nearly 500 in a very short period of time pretty cool. <laughs> but in his first time at First Corinthian Baptist Church, he's grown his congregation from 350 people to 10,000 members in the 10 years that he has been there. Um, not only has he grown his um, congregation to over 10,000 people, but um, <clears throat> the first time uh, in his first time at uh, FCBC, he uh, decided in the last election uh, that the community turned out, sorry, I'm not used to reading things, I'm used to like speaking from the heart, so that's what I'm gonna do. So he decided, as he was galvanizing the community, he wanted to really find a way to kind of put his message and the heart of his community first. So he did something that everyone in Harlem was absolutely afraid of. He ran for Congress against a 40-year incumbent, Congressman Rangel. Everyone thought he was crazy to do it. 
Everyone thought it was impossible, but that's the thing about Pastor Mike. He makes the impossible possible. And so he ran. He did not win, but he won our district that are filled with his constituents by a long run. Completely inspiring. And I think that as we start talking about audience engagement and audience building and community engagement, he is a person that represents the how. And sometimes I feel like the how is missing from all of our conversations. We can identify the issues, but the how do we get to the other side of it? He lives that. And so single-handedly, he is starting a revolution in our community. And there are two fold ideas that I really want to talk about really briefly, because I don't want to rob you from one second of hearing Pastor Mike. But in our breakout sessions, we talk about the commitment of community engagement. And he turns it on his head, creating programs at his church like Freestyle Fridays that celebrate the art of innovation and creativity. He looks at the community's wellness, and he kind of threads it throughout all that he does. Um, he launched the FCBC Dream Center, a transformative space designed to awaken the dreams of community through leadership development, arts enhancement, enrichment, I'm sorry, and economic empowerment. What I find to be extremely um, inspiring is we were talking about in one of our breakout sessions the idea of privilege. Well, he's turned privilege on its head as well, taking the pulpit off the pedestal, right? So like as the pastor, he speaks to his audience from one point of view, which is that each person in his audience or congregation are actually an evolving community of visionary and dreamers. And he talks to them and relates to them from that space. Lastly, using innovative, enhanced experience that are relevant, groundbreaking. Um, he continues to build capacity. As of right now, his sermon live streams to 40, 147 countries. And last year alone, eight, wait, I want to get the number right, 80,000 people live streamed his church services. So when we talk about a revolution of audience engagement, he is it. Finally, I would just like to say, personally, he's one of the most thoughtful, intelligent, inspiring risk takers that I have ever had the privilege to know. And Shay said something earlier about self-care, how we take care of each other, all of us who are on the front lines doing the work. I am privileged to say because he exists, he is a mechanism of self-care for our community. He is one of the reasons why Jonathan McCrory wakes up and fights as hard as he does. So without further ado, Pastor Mike. <laughs> Good afternoon. Let me try that again. Good afternoon. I, I, I cannot begin to tell you how excited I am to be here. I, I, uh, I feel affirmed in so many ways. Because I, 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 I'm an artist, first and foremost, I believe that. And the arts is such a big part of our church that to have an invitation from TCG has just really made my year, my month, whatever you want to call it. I, I'm excited and I'm grateful for this invitation. And I bring you greetings all the way from Harlem, USA. And so I'm thankful again to just be here. I'm going to share some things that I think will be helpful and in some way to talk about engagement uh, of audience or in our kind our world, our congregation. And I want to first talk about this church and how I came uh, to what we call FCBC. I came to FCBC 10 years ago, and before that I was serving at a church in Durham, North Carolina. I have to confess that being a pastor was not on my agenda when I was in grad school. Although I went to divinity school at Duke University, I did not feel that I had the tolerance or the patience to be a pastor and deal with people in and, and, and the kind of way I saw pastors dealing. And I tell people, I got backdoored, cornered into pastoring in a strange way. I graduated from Duke. Duke had hired me 
to be a university minister. They were only paying three-quarter time. And the three-quarter time wasn't that good, but they gave you full benefits. And so at the time I had two children, a wife, the full benefits sounded real good. And so I took the job, but we had a family of four. And what I was making wasn't cutting it. And I loved preaching. I loved preaching. I, even though I did not want to pastor, I loved preaching. I loved communicating. And so there was a small church in the east end of Durham that wanted